to what Chuck says and what pastor's message is. Because pastor gives us, he tells us what the Bible reading is going to be. And you know me, I've made it no secret. Oh, I wonder what this is about. But for me, there was one word that stuck out, and it was the word chosen. You know, when I was young, I didn't like that word. And if I'm being honest with you, I still don't like that word. Do you ever remember what it feels like when people would pick up teams? And then there were some people who were chosen first, some people chosen in the middle, and then there were some that were just chosen because you were left over. I didn't like that feeling. Then I remember the times I would try out for a role, audition for something, and I wasn't chosen. Or I interviewed for a job, and I wasn't chosen. Yeah, we get beaten down at work, at school, with relationships, our health, maybe somebody else's health issues, and chances are you feel anything but chosen in that moment. But I bring that up because in today's reading from Colossians, it reminds you that you are chosen. Not because you're better, but because God is good. He's good all the time. God chooses us. But in that choosing, he reminds us that we're chosen for one another. What does that look like? It maybe looks like you walking over to your neighbor's house to help somebody who is failing in health, and you mow their lawn for them because they just can't do it. Or you go over with that bowl of sugar, you know, or you take them cookies, or you just reach out and see the new neighbor that moved in, and you just go say hi. And that's what it looks like. Remember, you are chosen to show compassion, to show kindness, to show meekness, humility, forgiveness, and love. You were chosen. Let's stand. A reading from Colossians. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Here ends the reading. For the summer, I've put together a preaching series on being disciples. And as I think about discipleship, I look at it as opening our lives to the ongoing, persistent, life-transforming work of the Holy Spirit. That progressively, we learn and practice the love of Christ in everyday exchanges, in everything we say and do. Last week, the message addressed how discipleship has two essential dynamics. And the first is, it's how we as a congregation live together as a learning community, passionate in our intent to grow deeper in relationship with each other and with God. Second, it means personally, in every moment, being open to the risen Christ. Are we being consistent, authentic, and honest in our Christian witness? Hence, there's two parts of our sermon series. The first part are a set of six sermons I'm calling Being Church, right here, right now. 
The second part that will begin in July is considering ourselves as followers of Jesus. The aspect of our life as community, the aspect of our life as followers of Jesus. Please join me in prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth, may the shared reflection in our hearts be a delight to you, for you are our strength. You are our life. You are our love. Amen. When Sherry and I were looking at houses just prior to moving to this area, one of the few non-negotiables she put on what this house had to have was a laundry room right next to an entrance. Now, I'm thinking it's probably because of the shorter distance involved in carrying the clean laundry outside to dry. Well, that was part of it. But more importantly, was I would be one step from an entrance to take, oh, someone's nodding her head, yes. One step from the entrance to take off the dirty clothes when I came into the house so that I wouldn't be traipsing mud and dried leaves and twigs all through the house. This image of taking off the dirty clothes and putting on fresh apparel, Paul uses in three of his letters, Colossians, Ephesians, and Galatians, to talk about our life in Christ. That it's constantly a matter of putting off and putting on. He told the recipients of the epistles that there's a difference between that self-focused life apart from Jesus and the life lived in Christ in relationship with other believers. He pointed out that the dirty clothes worn by persons following the old life are immoral, indecent, evil thoughts, greed that he equated to idol worship, holding on to anger and bitterness towards other people, saying insulting or cruel things, telling lies. Paul said, these are the ways you once followed when you were living that kind of life. But now you take off. You get rid of those kinds of things. Now, looking at the grammar of that verse, what is really important is to notice he used you, plural. Y'all, use guys, all of you. He's talking about our life in community as Christian people. So often, particularly in America, the, the message gets focused to just the individual. But this life in Christ is shared in community. The Holy Spirit works not only in the life of the individual, but in the lives we have together so that when the non-believer looks on the community life we call the church, the congregation, they say, something's going on there that's not happening in my life. And I want it. I desire it. And that's why the emphasis is to take off those aspects of life that hurt ourselves that destroy the relationship, that impact the world in a bad way, and put on those qualities of compassion, of mercy. We learn to do what Scripture calls one-anothering. 
One anothering, by definition, is how groups of two or more persons do something either together or in concert in relationship with others. And why we need two words, one another, the language of the Bible uses just one word, alelon. And that word gets used close to 100 times in the New Testament. And of 47 of those instances, the word one anothering is connected with instruction on how the Christian community lives together. I'm going to highlight those 47. I'm not going to list all of them. One third of those directives of one anothering deals with our practice of unity in faith. Be at peace with one another. Don't grumble among one another. Accept one another. Bear with and forgive one another. That was in our passage that Keith read this morning. Forgive one another. Seek good for one another. Don't repay evil with evil. Confess our sins to one another. A second third of the passages say simply, love one another. That word agape that brings together, enjoying fellowship, understanding we are brothers and sisters, the serving of each other. Love one another as Jesus has loved us. Then there's a segment of the verses that stress the importance of having an attitude of humility with one another. Like, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Wash one another's feet. Clothe yourselves in humility. And then there are another 11 verses of various instructions, like, bear one another's burdens. Speak truth to one another. Comfort one another concerning the resurrection. Encourage. Build up one another. Pray for one another. Be hospitable to one another. Obviously, these qualities are desirable. But how is it? How does it happen that we can take off the ways that hurt our relationships and put on those qualities that build up our relationships with each other. Three thoughts. The first is this. Prayer. Now every time we gather together as a congregation, and maybe every day in your personal devotions, we say the Lord's Prayer. You know how it goes. And, and there's this phrase in the Lord's Prayer that says, your kingdom come. Okay. Guess what? God's kingdom is going to come and God's will is going to be done whether you say that prayer or not. In saying that prayer, what you are saying, as Martin Luther wrote so wonderfully, God, I want your kingdom to come in my life. I want your will be done through my life. That's what we're praying. And praying is not trying to find that fulcrum point to leverage God to do something God wouldn't do otherwise. Prayer is opening my heart to say, God, let it happen through me. I often point out that, that verse and in the Psalms, Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and see if there's any grievous way with me. And then lead me in your everlasting way. Prayer is the opposite of denial. Prayer is saying, God, I know I'm chosen. 
I know you love me, so in that love, okay, show me. Show me ways in my life that interfere with one another. Second, partners. There needs to be a point of accountability. There needs to be that, that trusted person, a friend, a family member, a spouse, a life group, who can be honest, who can say, okay, you've been talking about patience, and you want to have more patience, and this is what I'm hearing you're saying, and that's everything but being patient. Who is that person that God can speak through to hold me accountable? To hold us as congregation accountable? Some years ago, I was with a congregation that had a problem at congregational meetings. They didn't speak very charitably when they had disagreements. And the church council said, you know, we don't want to behave this way. This is not how God wants a congregation to behave. And so they prayed about it and became the point of accountability. They first would practice in, their, in the council meetings and appointed one of the members to be a discernimentarian. And this member wouldn't enter into conversations about issues, but all the time would be praying, are we acting in a way that models what Jesus said about loving each other? It's okay to have disagreements, but not take it to personal attacks. And then they brought it into congregational meetings. If, if someone began to speak in uncharitable ways, the president would say, John, you have an important point to make. Would you spend a few seconds and think about how you might want to rephrase that? And ahead of time, they wrote a letter to the congregation saying we're going to do that. And over a space of two years, they took off the old way and put on the new way of living together, one anothering in Christ. Which brings me to the third way. You practice it. You practice your way into new attitudes, into new behaviors. One anothering in Christ. In prayer, we ask God to reveal how are we becoming more and more like Jesus in our everyday interactions. And we have partners who help us act into that new behavior. And we practice it. Whether it's an instrument, whether it's learning a language, whether it's learning a new skill, it's in the practice that we develop it as our very nature. I want to leave you with a question. A what if. What if we who are the church, what if in our everyday exchanges, whether it was with a person who is at the tire store and you're getting a new set of tires on your car, or it's in the classroom, or it's in a group of close friends getting together for a cup of coffee or a cold beer, what if in every of our interactions, the small and the big, we began to practice those qualities of one another. Do you think that maybe it could start a movement that could transform society? No, how often do you hear people talk about, you know, the divisiveness in the world today? And certainly it's there. But what if in our conversations, whether we're talking about politics 
or an issue on the ballot or our neighbor's barking dog? What if in our conversations, in our interactions, we practice one anothering? How might the world be different? Please join me in prayer. Lord, we, we pray for your people, the church, here in Myerstown, across the world. And we, we pray for ourselves. Grant that we may be filled with the fire of your Holy Spirit, enabling to live the kind of life Jesus lives. Kindle in our hearts such love towards you that it wells up and spills over into everything we say and think and do. That not only would our lives be changed, but your world would be changed. May your kingdom done come. May your will be done.